and I'm specifically going to focus on human evolution and evolution. The reason I'm doing this is that if we take a look at it, if you take a look at the screen, 40, uh, that is uh, 29 plus 15. So you'll see a large degree of the paper. So that gives me 44% of the paper is actually evolution and human evolution on paper two. So it's a pretty big part of paper two. And that's why it's important for us to go through the topic. Most of this topic you can study on your own, but there is a few things that I want you to note while we go through today's lesson. Okay, this first question, and I did post the memo already on Google Classroom, so you can go and take a look. So I'm not worried specifically about the answers that I'm gonna go through today, just the way that you answer them, so that you know how to answer them. This is a typical short question of that section. And you will get one or two of these. Um, and so for specific examples, you have to know some detail, like who discovered which one, uh, which fossil. Uh, so the few, few important fossils um, with regards to South African examples, mainly cradle of humankind examples. Uh, now, the, the specific people that worked on these examples are like, for example, Lee Berger. And um, if you take a look at Louis and Mary Leakey, they actually worked on examples that are in the Great Rift Valley on the eastern side of Africa, not South Africa specifically. So they, they tend to favor South African examples. Um, so for example, like Australopithecus sediba or Karabu, the specific fossil that was found was Karabu. Um, Lee Berger found that one. Um, so take a look at South, the South African examples. And these are specifically, this is also a cradle of humankind fossil. Let's just quickly go through the name. Australopithecus means, Australo means from the south. Australopithecus, seven, eight man, um, basically, Australopithecus, seven. Australia, if you think of Australia, it's the most southern con continent. So um, that's why Australia means south. Pithecus means eight man. Then if we take a look at the rest of the, the example, the name, okay, the common name for this specific fossil was Karabu which means knowing or discovery specific fossil. There was actually a competition when this fossil was discovered. Um, and basically what, what was done is that it, um, they sent out a competition in schools and asked, can you give this fossil a name? And a grade 11 student, as far as I remember, won the competition and gave the name Karabu to this specific fossil. Professor Lee Berger is still doing research up to this day. He's also the one that discovered the main one in charge of the research team that discovered uh, Slopithecus naledi, or Homo, sorry, Homo naledi. Now these two are very closely related, Homo and Slopithecus, as you'll see in the next question. So, Let's take a look at the next question. So this is a typical question that you would find with what we call a cladogram. A, a cladogram um, shows the origin of certain species and how they, they then, how other species originated out of a single species. Now, very important in terms of the theme for this specific section of work is that we have a common ancestor with some of the other great apes. Now be very careful when interpreting what I'm saying now. We have a common ancestor with, for example, pan troclodytes, which is the chimpanzee. This does not mean that you are originating out of an ape. 
um, that is not what it's saying. It's, it says that us and the apes have a common ancestor. Now, be also very careful of thinking that this goes against uh, creationism. Um, and please go watch the videos that are posted, uh, the TED videos and so that are posted with regards to this. Um, just for your own, um, for yourself, please make sure that you know the difference. And what ni is nice with you guys is you actually know the difference between, uh, because you take religion studies between creationism, evolutionism, and the two can actually, if you take a look at it, walk hand in hand. Now, this is not necessarily going against your beliefs. So please go and take a look at the videos because if you take a look at evolution and what happens in Genesis 1, we can actually relate the two to one another in a lot of senses. So make sure that uh, you go through that just to ease yourself and mind because I don't want you to create a block in your, in your head when we do this section. Because it's such a large amount of math, you cannot afford not to go through the section just because of your beliefs. And the section doesn't go against your beliefs. Uh, so please just reassure yourself and go watch those videos. Okay, so let's take a look at at this question, in this cladogram, uh, we can see there's different species. One great ape, uh, other than those that are hominid, uh, they're all homonin, but only this side is homonid. These are homonids. This is a homonin. All of them are homonin, but homonids, that's this side of the spectrum. Okay, so the, if we take a look at, at the lines, um, if we, for example, take a look at one of the ones that we're going to use commonly in this example, Australopithecus africanus, southern ape man coming from Africa. We can see that he originated over there. And if we, if we take a look at the timeline and we draw a line across the timeline, draw a line over there. Uh, let me just shift that line a bit to where it's supposed to be so it's straight. Okay. So that's where he originated about 3 million years ago. And then we can also see where he became extinct over there. His line stops there. And so he became extinct about 1 million years ago. Now, if we take a look at this, we will also see, for example, that we, we outlived. We're the only hominid species left. We outlived all the other hominid species. And so that we don't ha really have any direct family in terms of evolution anymore. We outlived all the other species and probably outcompeted all of the other species. The main reason for this is not because we are actually stronger, but we were more adapted to change or the changes that happened that, um, on Earth for the current situation. And so, for example, our closest relative here was Homo neanderthalensis, and new research shows that we actually interbred with Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, so uh, it's not totally a separate species. They actually reclassified Homo neanderthalensis. It's actually now called, we are Homo sapiens subspecies sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens. And Homo neanderthalensis is actually now Homo sapiens subspecies neanderthalensis because we actually had communion. We actually had children with neanderthalensis so uh, we could interbreed and have kids and their kids could have kids let's take a look at the questions 
name the most recent ancestor of the Homo genius. Uh, Homo genus. So here we go, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo neops, and the Flentes, and Homo habilis, all originated out of Australopithecus africanus. There's the split over there, another split over there, and another split over there. But by that, by that split, um, Australopithecus africanus was no longer on Earth anymore. So all the splits came out of Australopithecus africanus. So this is our common ancestor for all Homo habilis, which was also called commonly handyman, Homo erectus, which means for the one that stands upright, Homo sapiens, um, Homo sapiens is then us, okay, and then Homo neanderthalensis, as I told you, which is uh, the common caveman, as we refer to them. It actually means, neanderthalensis means it comes from the Neander Valley. Neander Valley, the first Homo neanderthalensis was found in uh, the Neander Valley in Germany. So, second question. Give the period of existence for the species mentioned in question 1.4.1. Now, I've already done that with the two lines that I've drawn across here. And unfortunately, this line is not very readable. It's about 300 million years ago up to about 100 million years ago. Now, according to the memo, it actually says 2.8 million years ago. But they do give you, they would give you some leeway of a, um, on this line over here because they know that it's not that readable. So if you say 300 million years ago to 1 million years ago, that's perfectly fine. Then, state the number of genera represented in the diagram. Okay, so the number of genuses. Okay, genera is the plural for genus. Genera, let's take a look. There's pan, that's one. There's ardipithecus, that's two. There's Paranthropus, that's three. There's Australopithecus, that's four. And there's Homo, that is five. So there are five genera within this diagram. So, Can I ask you? Yes. Um, sorry, what's 1.4.1? 1.4.1, 1. 1. we said was Australopithecus africanus. Australopithecus africanus. Because all of the Homo, Homo species split out of Australopithecus uh, africanus. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Then, um, based on the diagram, give one facial feature that differentiated humans from Australopithecus africanus. We're not prognathus. Okay, so prognathus means that if you have a protruding chin, protruding chin, then you're prognathus. So you see it, uh, if you take a look at Australopithecus africanus, its chin is sticking out, okay? Um, and then again, for Homo habilis, chin is sticking out, uh, Neanderthalensis chin is sticking out, Homo erectus chin is sticking out. So all of these, they, they have this, this mouth, their mouth parts are sticking. Look at Ardipithecus ramidus. It's sticking out tremendously. But as we move from down here to up to where we are, you can see that our face has become more flattened. Um, so the slope of our face is more flattened. We don't have this chin sticking up. Uh, a common uh, example that they give, I'm just going to draw, uh, take a, a, over there a, an arrow. If we draw an, a line, that goes down the slope of the face. You can see that line is twisted over there. If I go to pan, it's even more twisted. So I have to, it's, it's slanted. There we go. If we take a look at Ardipithecus, it's even more slanted. But let's take this now to Homo sapiens. And then you will see that if I had to draw it on our Homo sapiens, we get, um, it almost goes, down straight down instead of slanted and so we don't have a slowed face we are not prognathous 
identify any two species that used both tools and fire. Okay, so for this, you actually have to know the work very well. The main two species uh, that I know has used tools, uh, Homo habilis has used tools, and Homo sapiens, us, we've used tools. And they say Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Homo neanderthalensis will all fall into that. So Homo habilis does not fall into that. He used tools, we called him handyman, but he didn't use fire. So they're saying these top three species are the ones that actually used fire and tools. Okay, so next question. Name one Australopithecus africanus fossil found in South Africa. Uh, it's Littlefoot, Mrs. Place, and Tongchild. Um, Karawa was Australopithecus sediba, not Africanus. So Tongchild, Mrs. Place, and Littlefoot. Littlefoot and Mrs. Place was found very close to one another. Then, List two types of evidence that can be used to support the out of Africa hypothesis. Now, somewhere you're going in your paper, you're going to find some question about the out of Africa uh, theory. Um, they love asking it as part of an essay question, but at least two of your marks of that paper and up to about seven marks out of the paper is going to be the out of Africa theory. Now, main things around the uh, out of Africa theory is um, there's fossil evidence, there's the mitochondrial DNA evidence, and there's also cultural evidence that shows that humans originated originally out of Africa and then moved to the rest of the world. Oh yes, I see now where they got use of stone tools and use of fire. Um, so if we take a look, um, they actually indicated it over on the side here. So for question um, 1.4.5, I see they found it on the side here. So this is when the use of tools started, and this is where the use of fire started. And so that's where they got the answer for uh, 1.4.5. Okay, then. In evolution, now this is not human evolution, this is evolution, before, this is the, the lesson you do before human evolution. In evolution, you also did it in grade 10, but that was very a very long time ago for, for some of you. So you, you hit this information very deep down or very far at the back of your head. And so that's why they have to recap on this section. They also give a little bit more detail than they did in grade 10. And so one of two of the uh, main theories that you're going to go through in this section of work is those of Lamarck and those of Darwin. So for Lamarck, this, is, this question is based on Lamarck. Now Lamarck's theories uh, later, as you'll see in question 3.3.2 as well, was later rejected. Pretty good theories, uh, pretty sound research, but because of new research coming up, we uh, we could like say, okay, Lamarck, uh, very good theories, and and you had a very good imagination to use the evidence you had, but unfortunately, your your theory didn't stand the test of time, and so science is not a constant thing; it changes all the time. Uh, as we get new research in and as we discover new things, then we discover, okay, what we, what we thought was previously uh, right is, can become wrong. And this is typical of, of what happened to Lamar. So the question says, the diagram below shows the elongation of the neck of the giraffe according to Lamar. Okay, so what Lamar is saying is that if I, if this giraffe, had to stretch his neck to reach the taller vegetation on the trees, then he would actually, his, his neck would become longer as he stretched it more and more and more. And that inherited characteristic that he received 
will then be passed on to his offspring. Okay, so according to the evidence that he had at that stage, it was correct. But if you think about it, if you go to the gym and you are like pumping the iron and you're building muscle, it's all good and well. You're going to have muscle, but you're not going to pass that on to your children. The muscle that you've built is not going to change your genes. And remember, at that stage, they didn't know about DNA and they didn't know how about genetics at all. But you're not going to pass those genes on to your children. Just because you're buff doesn't mean that your children are going to be buff. Uh, because you, you got those muscles in the gym, not because you inherited them from your father necessarily. So that's what the mass theories would have implicated. Um, and of course, that's not correct. So let's take a look at the question. Use the example in the diagram to describe the mass theories for changes in the Dunroff's neck over time. So we're busy with, please note, we're busy with question 3.3. I'm focusing on the questions that regards with human evolution and evolution. Okay, so what they're saying is that all giraffes have short necks, okay? Initially, all of them had short necks. Then, the giraffes frequently stretch their necks so as to reach the leaves that are available higher up these trees. And so as they stretch their necks, their necks became longer and the characteristics for long necks it was acquired. They acquired a characteristic and, and that was then passed on to the next generation. So they, they, they acquired long necks because they were stretching and they passed that on to their offspring. And eventually all the giraffes had longer necks. Now in the next question, you will see that um, if we take a look at Darwin, what Darwin is saying, Darwin is saying, no, um, they didn't get the characteristics of long necks because they, they were stretching their necks and then passed it on to the next generation. What actually happened is there was a lot of genetic variation in giraffes. There were some giraffes with long necks, there were some giraffes with short necks, and we, we see this in fossil evidence as well. And so the giraffes with the long necks, they could reach the, the, the leaves at the top of the trees. And so they could feed better, they could survive better, and they because they survived, they could then go on and have sex with other giraffes with long necks and have kids. Well, the giraffe with the short neck, he didn't have enough energy to have sex and have kids. He died, so he never had kids. And so all the giraffes with the short necks died and the giraffes with the long necks survived and passed their genes on to the next generation. And so now all giraffes have long necks because the giraffes with the short necks could not survive, they could not compete, and they all died. So it's very gruesome, but that's the way it works, and that is called natural selection. And Darwin was, was not the first person to suggest evolution. When Darwin came onto the scene, they knew evolution was happening. Um, they could see it, but they never knew the mechanism. They didn't know how it happened. And so now they know how it happened because now they know that it's because of natural selection. So he just, just suggested he's the mechanism for evolution uh, that was correct. Unlike Lamarck, who also had a mechanism, but, but it was found that it wasn't correct. So then the second theory, uh, the second question asked, why was Lamarck's theory rejected? Okay, there was... Later, no evidence that shows acquired characteristics are inherited. So just because you are, as I said, just because you are buff, doesn't, your child's not going to be buff because you spend time in the gym. So there was no evidence for 
that those acquired characteristics can be passed over onto the next generation then. There's no evidence that structures used more frequently became more developed. Not quite there, but okay. Uh, for, for, for example, the, the, the stretching of the neck is not necessarily going to make your neck longer uh, in this case. And then we, we couldn't see a change in the phenotype that could lead to a change in the genotype. Just because you are going to have the muscle, it's not changing your DNA just because you're building muscle. It's just changing your muscle, but it's not changing the DNA inside your cells. Okay, let's go through this essay question quickly. Huh? Yes. So why are we learning about Lemeke? Okay. So we're learning about Lamar because it's part of the scientific process. Uh, it was a theory and they commonly asked Lamar, uh, please don't skip Lamar just because we rejected his, theory, his theories. We, uh, they, they, they love asking Lamar or they love asking a question about Lamar versus Darwin in the papers. And why we're we learning about Lamar is because they want to teach you about the scientific process and how we prove theories and how we disprove theories and how the whole hypothesis and testing and then um, how you test your hypothesis and then you come up with a theory and it becomes, so that whole process is displayed in what Lamarck did in what Darwin did. Now Darwin was meticulous. He, he his, his research was more sound, he had more proof, he collected more information, he had hypotheses, and he proved these hypotheses. And Lamarck took a look at a few observations and decided, oh no, there we go. He's got some evidence and this is probably what happened because of the evidence he's collected. But Darwin was more meticulous as this. They actually have a weird example of how they, they, um, uh, of how they show how meticulous Darwin was with, with acquiring evidence because even before he got married, <laughs> he had a whole, he actually had a long list of pros and cons um, of why you should and why you shouldn't get married, married and that he collect, everything he did in his life was about collecting evidence and coming to a conclusion. And so even in that, one of the things he stated that if he didn't get married, you would be able to afford more books. <laughs> um, but he did like to get married. And just for interest sake as well, um, we talked about at the beginning of the lesson how are the two theories of um, creationism and of evolution actually don't oppose one another. Um, and if you take a look at Darwin, he was actually a, a minister. He was, um, he was a clergy. He was a he, was, he, he studied the, he actually studied the Bible. Um, so he actually, uh, when he made his theories, uh, he also didn't consider them to be opposing to what is happening in Genesis. Okay, so let's go to the last question. Question four, describe Darwin's theory. Now, Lamarck's the one's theory and Darwin's the second theory. Darwin's theory became, uh, we now know is correct, and Lamarck's theory was rejected. Of natural selection, see, it doesn't say Darwin's theory of evolution. We knew evolution, Darwin knew evolution was happening, but they needed to find the mechanism for evolution. And so his mechanism was natural selection and explain how it could lead to speciation by geographical isolation. So there's two parts to this question, Darwin's theory of natural selection, and then speciation by ge geographical isolation. So if we take a look at the answers of the question, let's take a look. This is the first section. As I said, I did post the memo for you, but I wanna go through and explain just everything here. But on Google Classroom, it's already there. So Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Organisms produce a large number of offspring. So there's one, two, three, just in a short, um, three different 
um, offspring just in a, in a small area here. So there's lots of offspring. And there's great variation, genetic variation amongst the offspring. So you can see that they are phenotypically different, which means that all three of these are genotypically different. So there's variation in the genes. This one has a short neck, that one's a medium neck, and this one has a long neck. So there's variation in the population. Then, some have favorable characteristics. A long neck is favorable in this situation because it could reach the leaves at the top of the trees, but a short neck was not favorable. And some do not. So this one is not favorable. Short neck, uh, you're not gonna make it, you can't reach the leaves, you can't eat, so you're gonna die. When there's a change in the environment con uh, conditions, or if there's competition, there's competition here, there's no change here, but there is competition here. So when there's competition between the lot, who's gonna win? The one with the longest neck. So whilst organisms with unfavorable characteristics will be less suited and they will die. So the ones with the more favorable characteristics, they survive. One with the less favorable characteristic, the short neck, they will die. And the organisms that survive, they reproduce. So these two are gonna to get together and they're gonna make babies. They reproduce and thus they pass on this long neck gene to the next generation. And then that genotype survives, that allele survives on the gene. The next generation will therefore have a higher proportion of long neck individuals of favorable characteristics. So more are gonna have long necks in the next generation less will have short necks because the short necks didn't survive to have kids. Okay, so that's Darwin's theory of natural selection. 